Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for joining us online and in person. It's really exciting to be able to hold events back in person again. So uh, welcome to our newly renovated student lounge and library. It's, uh, I think this is the first event we hold here. So it's really exciting. Um, yeah. So um, oh, after the event, there's going to be some drinks and nibbles. So stick around. We'd love to say hi and talk to you all. And um, there's, if you need bathrooms, there's bathrooms all the way down uh, the other side, through the door next to the front desk. Okay. So um, this afternoon's event is the official start of our Designing Be Better Futures discussion series. Um, the, last, the last 12 months have been a challenge for all of us, um, we're, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to seeing better, um, better times ahead. But as recent times have shown, this, the only certain thing about better times ahead is what we do with that and how we respond to the things that happen. So this is what we want to try and do with this uh, series, is to just... Um, yeah, just create better futures <laughs> and talk about design. We're hoping to run these events on the first Wednesday of every month. And we already have a lineup of speakers for upcoming ones, so keep an eye out. We're trying a hybrid format, so um, we've got some online um, attendees as well. And at the end of the event, after the panel discussion, we'll have a Q&A and I'll moderate um, questions here and online. So before we begin, I would like to, we would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional owners of the first pe and the first people of the land on which we meet with you all today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So today's theme is design is everywhere. And after you meet our illustrious panel, the idea will become clearer. Andrew Barnum is a designer, musician, artist, and lecturer here at JMC. And when he's not teaching at JMC, he's studying his PhD or working on his latest album. I think it's the ninth, if I'm not wrong. Today, Andrew will be our keynote speaker, and he will, you will hear about his journey and his approach to design. He's also joined by Amara Primero, and she's an award-winning composer and a managing director of Prime Chord, Primer Chord Productions. She works between Sydney and Los Angeles and has composed for numerous television series, including the latest season of Bondi Rescue. Amara is also an alumna of JMC. Ben Romales is a creative consultant and high performance coach who lectures at JMC and runs his own production company, Sillamore Studios. He's worked with Cricket Australia, been a director of, for, of content for Commonwealth Bank and Adobe, and has produced several albums. Finally, you'll notice that we have a screen with live illustration, and that is courtesy of Alan Shen from Shapeshifters. He will be graphic recording our event during the discussion. Alan is an award-winning filmmaker, designer, and illustrator, and he's also lecturing at JMC. Thank you all for being here today, and I'll give it over to Andrew. Thank you, Diana. All right, so... Um, uh, what I'm going to do today, guys, is tell you kind of a little eight-minute life story. And uh, what I'm talking about here is that design is everywhere, and it will take you places. My story could be your story. So if you're the three key themes that we're kind of discussing today is in pursuit of the finished product, you break a lot of eggs, and you learn a lot of ropes. Secondly, design never stays still. And when we're talking about design, we're not necessarily talking about I'm making a poster or I'm making a logo. We're designing our lives. We're designing the world that we live in. And we walk the line somewhere between science and art. So it begins now. I was born in Connecticut, USA. I have American father. I have a New Zealand mother. I've been a dual citizen of both countries since 2000. I arrived in Melbourne, Australia, age seven, raised in Sydney to the high school certificate. I was always interested in graphic art, uh, learned guitar in year five. By the time I finished high school, I'd been in three bands. I then went off, uh, 
to RMIT because it was a, it, my mother was recommended it. She didn't know what to do with her creative son. So we're gonna send you to Melbourne. Thanks, mum. So off I go, I finish my uh, design course at RMIT. Uh, and I started as a junior art director as an internship at McCann Erickson Advertising. This is a million years ago, guys. Uh, but it was here that I met my first mentors, the people that show you the way while you're an early young fellow. So I was uh, doing advertising and design. My colleagues, we formed a band called Metropolis. And at the same time, I got roped into singing and writing a national jingle for a Coca-Cola brand. So, uh, I'm trying to let you guys know that these things just kind of happen. And if you're there and you're ready to take on the opportunity, these things can happen. So that was my pursuit. So we continue to break eggs. What happens is that I meet a fellow who says, there's somebody in Los Angeles, the inventor of the windsurfer. He wants to form a magazine. I was looking for an exit from Australia, from Sydney. I knew that advertising wasn't going to be the be all and end all. So his his opportunity gave me the excuse to leave Sydney. So I get on the plane. We see the presentation go through. He doesn't like the magazine. So Andrew is stuck in Los Angeles. What's he going to do? Same day that I arrive, Elvis Presley dies. Is this, is this a sign for me? So design never stays still. You are always kind of moving, shaping, uh, trying to adapt to whatever's going on. So I'm in Los Angeles. I'm living there. Don't have a car, got to get a car. I start freelancing as a graphic designer, but I was also always interested in music. It's been in my life this whole time. I meet a Kiwi in a guitar store. We form a band. We start playing around Los Angeles, uh, doing gigs and stuff. We get offered a record deal. We turn it down. Didn't like the sound of this. Meanwhile, I meet my soulmate, Lissa Mendelssohn. She and I break up the previous band and we form our own band, art, design, music. We call ourselves Live Nude Girl. That's the name of our band. So, uh, we get married in Los Angeles. It's a great love story. She's my soulmate. And she says, I can sing. So what happens is that we are making demos. We are performing live in Los Angeles and we make a cassette tape. It finds its way to Sydney. And who takes it there? My mentor from my first advertising job. So all of a sudden, uh, my cunning mother, again, coming to my rescue, she says, we, you, should, you guys should come to Sydney and to see what's going on down here. Let, my wife has never been to Australia before. Day three, she wakes up and she says to me, in tears, Andrew, I've got to call my mum and dad and tell her that we're moving here. And this was the beginning of us moving to Sydney. We arrive here. We have a record deal with Festival Records. And this is the birth of a band called Vita Beats. We make demos, we record at, Sydney, at Studios 301. And the next thing you know, we have a top five Australian single, this song called Boombox, that my wife, Lissa, makes the video for. All on shoestring budgets, all for nothing. So things start to happen. We are freelancing as graphic designers and we are work, working at musicians uh, at the same time. So it's very serious all the time never standing still, always moving, always adapting, always moving into what the next thing is. And now that I'm seriously en ex ensconced as supposedly a musician and as a designer working in financial community and media, the arts, we move into a big old church hall over in Erskineville and this becomes our life for 25 years. We have a beautiful daughter born in 1994, my daughter Cayenne, Spice Girl 1994, or you, uh, uh, Instagram users, and I meet I meet uh, who who becomes my mentor, another music mentor, a guy named uh, Boris Hunt. So, I guess from here I move into uh, education. This is after 20 years of working as a designer in Sydney. 
I become the uh, head of college at Billy Blue College of Design. This is 2006. So I, I, it's always about this thing of I'm working in academia, I'm working on my art, I'm working for design clients, authoring a book uh, for um, Australian design. Uh, we ended up doing a textbook called Graphic Design Australian Style Manual. Then along comes a fellow sitting in the back row, Sean Callan, and, and we find out that JMC is looking to launch a design BA. We develop the course, a group of us, we write the course, we deliver the course, and here we are today. Meanwhile, I'm a uh, PhD candidate at UTS um, studying the idea of conditions for Australian songwriters. We sell up the big church in uh, Erskineville. We move to the countryside. So uh, to sum this up, whatever Alan has been able to draw so far, design is about planning your life, but also being open to taking, uh, taking chances, gaining opportunities, being brave enough to move forward and do whatever comes your way. If you do that, you'll you'll have a career in design, you'll have a career in the creative industry. So thank you for listening. That's the end of my story for now. How does that sound? Thank you so much. So uh, this is where we now lean into this idea of our three subjects. In pursuit of the finished product, you break a lot of eggs, which I hope I, I, hope I explained to you. Design never stands still, and we walk the line between science and art. So of my beautiful panelists, how do we start this conversation on any one of those three topics? I think we have to go back and talk about Elvis. When Elvis died and you went, maybe this is a sign, were you thinking there's an opening? I, I think so. I'm just curious. Is that what you thought? There's a vacancy. <laughs> it's so funny that you should mention that because I don't know. You know our our um, colleague Clive, yeah. the bass player. Yeah. He the same thing happened to him. He turned up in Los Angeles the day that Elvis died. So I don't know what it means. I think that you know we should tell people that what you're really waiting for is someone famous to die, so that there's a vacancy. That's yeah. I think that's a good strategy. How are you going to? Yeah, you can't get a job until somebody leaves. Is that really the way it works, Amara? <laughs> <laughs> so, seriously, how do we talk about this thing? What do you want to talk about first? The finished product, design never standing still, or walking the line between science and art? I will start. Yes. Um, I think there's, first of all, thank you for having me today and, you know, wonderful panel to be on. Thank you, James C. Um, I think there's two ways. So, like, we've obviously been discussing this design idea for a little while, but, um, you know, Andrew, you talk about design uh, in, your, in your life or crafting your life mm. sort of thing, the, the idea behind, uh, you know, you, you, you set out into your career path with one idea and it might ne not necessarily be sort of, you know, lined up straight, you know, straight with dot, 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 dot. And I think Steve Jobs said it once is that you can't, connect the dots looking back, uh, sorry, looking forward, only looking back. Mm. So in, in other words, you just don't know where your life is going to take you. Um, so there's definitely that concept. But what I was actually um, interested in, in looking at also is breaking, when we talk about breaking a lot of eggs, but breaking a lot of eggs in your actual craft, your actual career. Mm. So can I get an idea just from the room here? Um, how many people are in, like musicians, for example? Any musos in the room? No? Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, film, TV? Yeah, film, TV. Just so I get a bit of a vibe. Film, TV? No? Um, just call out some industries maybe that you're in. Or design? Does, like, okay, design. Animation. Animation? Okay, cool. All right, that's great. Fantastic. So, um, because obviously I'm going to make some reference back to music and I don't want to bore you too much as well about, you know, my industry, but I want to make it relevant to yours. Um, so... I love this concept of uh, talking about design within your industry. So yes, your career path and how you, you create that path in your life, but within your actual industry. So the creative pro uh, process. 
um, 99% of the time, I think, I spend breaking eggs. Um, you know, if you want to use that sort of as an analogy. And I think you have to do that. You have to, uh, you have to be okay with those ideas that you're coming up with all the time because the breaking eggs are the ideas that you're having. So, um, you know, how many people have unfinished ideas? Yeah, like everyone. Is, it's is a room it, full of right, so unfinished is ideas. Room, yeah, right? Is there, is there anyone in the room who, like, uh, just can say, I, every idea I have, I write it down, and then I have an end date, and I finish it, nail it, done. Is there anyone like that in the room? Okay, right. So we're all human. Great. <laughs> um, so I think that's why I like to say that the whole, there's 99% of the process is breaking eggs. You know, you're going back and you're, you're coming up with an idea. You're, you're scratching that idea. You're, you're, maybe you're tortured over the idea. Maybe you're, um, you're, you're going back and forth. Whether it's for you, the end product is for you, or whether or not it's for um, a brief, for a client, that is the process. It's essentially the same thing. The only difference is I think when you're working for a client, then you kind of have a deadline and you've kind of got, got to get your shit together. You know, mm. you've kind of, when you're doing it for yourself, there's a little bit more of that, uh, you know, I'll just put that on the side. And I think if you can really make it a point, keep breaking those eggs, you know, keep coming up with the ideas, keep um, going through that process. But at some point, you've got to make the omelette. You know what I mean? Like so many people, you know, they're, they're smashing eggs all the time and they're, they're adding paprika and salt and pepper and then they're taking out the paprika and they're taking out the salt and the pepper and whatever else, you know. And that's it. they're still stirring, they're mixing it all up and they're like, oh, we'll put that to the side. Like you can't do that. You've got to make the omelette. So it's, mm. it's sort of like that's mm. the, the 1% I find is that kind of the end product and the breaking eggs, the, you know, that's the 99%. Yeah, so, so it's this whole idea of, you're just continually making it. Something is going to be, something has right. got to be finished by next Tuesday, right, but, exactly. but something doesn't have to be finished by next Tuesday. But all of them are, are part of you designing the way things are gonna work. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Yes or no, Ben? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are we, how can we get involved with this group here and ourselves? How can we talk about making all this sort of stuff become relevant to each other and to the group. I think we could talk about what breaking eggs actually looks like okay. or what it is. You know, we, we use this term breaking, yeah. you know, you've got to break an eggs because, you know, it's a cute metaphor. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a usefulness in saying what it actually is. And, and for me, it's, it's looking at things that piss you off. The most creative people I know are people who look at the world and get pissed off that it's not different. Yeah. And then they set about trying to make it different. So uh -huh. Amara and I are sitting here for 20 seconds and we're pissed off by the chairs and we want to change them. We want to redesign them. Oh, and I it's it's very tempting to start sketching some alternatives. I thought you were pissed off at what I was talking about. No, 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 no. It's... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. So I think breaking eggs for me starts with this philosophy or this ethos of not accepting the world as it is of looking at it and going, what if we could change that? What if I could redesign that? What if, you know, it's easy when you look at a product and you go, what if I could tinker with that? Mm -hmm. And kids do this really well. When, when you have kids, you just, they just pull it apart. Like mm -hmm. they break eggs and everything else. Mm -hmm. They have no problem pulling everything apart just to see how it went together. And I, I think that is at the heart of that childlike play and mm -hmm. breaking things apart is at the heart of what we're talking about. The hard part, what Amara is saying, is then you have to have the discipline to put it back together in a way that is pleasing. Well, you know, is that because we have to pay the bills? Is that because we actually need income to fund our gameplay? I, th I think it's also important to separate the things. You know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert makes this point that mm. there are those there are those activities or those projects that you should not overburden mm. with making money. Uh -huh. that need to be their own thing and satisfy a whole bunch of other criteria, but they're not, it's not like, what does she call them? There's the unicorns and then there's the pack horses, you know, okay. and the pack horses you load up and they bring in the money, hmm. but not every project gets to do that. There are some of my favorite projects will never see the light of day. They weren't written to a brief. 
they were for me mm. or for, for a group mm. of people that I know. And they're my, some of my favorite work is mm. in that, but it, it, it had its own intrinsic value. Mm. And then there are the ones like Amara was talking about where you've got a week to deliver and it's going to be tough, but you know it pays. Can I ask, um, as a matter of curiosity, then, why didn't they see the light of day? That's a great question. I, I, I'm, I'm just always interested yeah. and curious, you know, like because as artists, you know, yeah. how many people like, yeah. like, like I know a lot of artists say, oh, it's just for me. It's mm. just for me. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not doing anything with that. And I'm like, but sometimes I ask why. I'm pretty, I, and I'm going to guess, uh, well, and maybe this is not as true of graphic artists as mm. musicians, because mm. we musicians and especially songwriters are a pretty cagey bunch. Right, so there's nothing more unsettling than a room full of aspiring songwriters talking about their feelings. It's very, <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. I'm and feeling it, anger coming from that. I teach conversation, but I teach, yeah, and I teach this every week. So it's that's my default. But uh, in answer to your question, I I have a very, you know, I have a very strict process whereby I decide pretty early on if this if this piece if this composition is going to be for public consumption mm. or if it's for another purpose. And sometimes they cross over, but if I'm writing something that's really personal and something that I need to write in order to have some catharsis, mm -hmm. in order to explore an idea, I don't need to share that with anyone for it to have served its purpose. Mm. And, and it's the personal sort it's, of thing. Yeah. It's, it's close to your heart and yeah. it's private. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and sometimes that. you make something that's very personal. And you go, oh, actually, now I am okay with sharing it. But most of the time I feel that setting the intent early on for me works in, in keeping them, not, not blurring the lines between the intent. Uh, yeah. so, so can I bring up this distinction between what design is as a practice? Because design as a practice is fairly transactional, whether it be a logo or a building, it tends, it tends to be, we're trying to get something finished. Whereas music, Music, isn't music a little bit more ephemeral? They're both magic tricks. That you, you designers, you all you all have a blank piece of paper, right? And there's nothing there, and then you make something there, like something mm. appears. You 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 literally perform a magic trick. Mm. Music, we just we have a sound, we have a, a vacant space, and we put notes in it. Mm. We manifest something where before there was nothing. And this is we were talking about this before, but the form to me doesn't matter as much as the intent. If your intent is to create something where before there was nothing that's a magic trick mm -hmm. that's what design is in my opinion mm -hmm. well oh, no i was just gonna say that's amazing um and there was something that you would i uh, remember you were talking about um kids you said you know they they have this idea well no <laughs> that kids uh will i can't remember now what you said uh put, pull everything apart or um and they don't need it sparked permission. Something. No, right. And the other thing as well that they do is they'll they'll do things and they'll finish it and they're happy to put it forward and go, it's finished, it's great, and you know they're okay with that. So what happens to us like as adults? Finished, great. You know, like that's that's a hard thing for any of us to do and to sort of get to that point and know that, you know how people sometimes say it can always be better, it can always be better, it can always be better, you know, and just being okay with that, being okay to submit it and or, or complete the project and go, okay, it can always be better. The other way I like looking at it is that it's not necessarily that it can be better, it can be different because mm. by implying that it can be better it's like what you're going to give me shit like you're going to give me your best work you know i would hope that it is your best work that you're putting forward um so yeah there was just something that you've totally said about children there they just sort of we have to be in creativity a bit more childlike i think sometimes and that's the thing about you know if i've got a composition that's pissing me off and i'm just going to use that term because that's the feeling you know <laughs> you, i'm tinkering with something and it won't work i can't get it to work and it pisses me off and then I keep working at it. And at some point it stops pissing me off. And then I get to stop. And Jeff Buckley made that point, you know, cause he was a notorious perfectionist and it crippled him. Mm. And he's, he, you know, he and a bunch of others, I'm sure have said this idea that you don't ever finish an album. You just decide to stop. And I think that is the discipline that comes with being a professional creative. You know, that you could keep going, you know, yeah. you could keep refining it for the next 10 years. You just have to stop mm. and, and say, okay, time to put my energy into something else because that's what four-year-olds teach us they they spend 10 minutes on something and they go cool i'm done what's next 
And, yeah, you know, yeah. We seem to get like dumber as we get older. <laughs> well, it's just, well, I, I keep coming back to this basic difference between the two because you, you make a piece of communication design because something, something needs to happen. Somebody is moving house. Somebody is announcing something. Somebody is saying there's a new product and there's a new label. Where does music fit into that? Does music, do we need more new music? Anybody answer me that question? Do we need more new music or is there plenty already? That's an inflammatory question. <laughs> That's a question to piss him off, you see. No, I love that because Bob Dylan talks about this in Brain Pickings. Bob Dylan posted, anyone read Brain Pickings? Sean, yes, you read everything. Um, Brain Pickings, if you haven't found it, is Maria Popova curates this. Um, yeah. It's phenomenal. But Bob Dylan wrote an article where he basically said, don't write any more songs. We don't need any more songs. We've got enough songs to last the rest of time. Mm. We could distribute. Was, was that after he had like written? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Zillion... After right. he's got all these. Yeah. This is recently. So that yeah. was the musician. Yeah, either yeah totally. Kind of yeah, I, he's basically <laughs> saying I'm done. But he sort of went on this long rant and said, "We do not need any more music. We've got enough to basically distribute to the entire population for the rest of time. Mm. So don't write any more songs unless he had this this big rant, and then he said, unless you really have something to say." you really have a compulsion mm. and a need and a desire to express something and you, and you need to give it to the world. And only under those conditions do you get to write a song. Otherwise, don't worry about it. <laughs> so he basically created this call to action whereby he, he's laying it down. He's saying, yeah, like, don't do this half-hearted. Don't mm. do this on mm. a whim, you know, or because you thought it might be something that'll tickle, you know, tickle mm. your fancy later on. Like, mm. you do it because you have a compulsion to say something and you need to do it now. And tell the world. So, go. Sorry, really quickly, but sometimes the um just to just to challenge that, yeah. sometimes the the audience they don't want to hear something important. You know what I mean? Like when <laughs> you're at, you're at the nightclub or something, you you don't care what that person's saying. You know when they're saying Bob you doesn't know, go to me nightclubs, does he? Up, you know, and what like yeah. <laughs> no. The, the, the audience sometimes, you know, you, or your market, you know, whether you're a design student, whatever your area is, sometimes your perception of um, you know, do we need, like, do we need new design chairs? Well, okay, you ask us, yeah, we would say, <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, some people go, we've got enough chairs, a chair is a chair, you know, it depends who the, who the consumer is. But it's interesting, it comes back to, to what Ben is talking about. I am young, I am here now, I don't like the world as it exists right now, I feel that there is room to change things. We, no, well, the other thing too is no one cares if you don't write another song. Like the, the hardest thing is that or the hardest thing to accept is no one cares if you guys don't get up and, and draw another image or write another song or do anything creative. No one cares mm. because the world is full of people who are doing that on a daily basis. The person who has to care the most by a, by a long way is you. You have to get up and kick your own ass into thinking it's an amazing idea because no one else is going to do it. And mm. I think that's, that's, Really, the, the question of whether or not we need more music or more design, it, it's, it's more about saying, I need to believe that we do and, and yeah. I need to, to do it daily. So aren't you saying we need to keep the wheels turning? We need to keep the lights on. Is that kind of what we're talking about? We've got to just got to keep, keep this world in which we live. We've got to keep going. So I think it's interesting for the design students here to think about there actually has been a radical change in the notion of communication design within the last... 10 years with the, with the arise of IDEO and, and just this idea of design processes changing, we, we don't really just jump to the finished product anymore. It's more like if we've got the opportunity to design, can't we think about how we can make this actually valuable versus disposable? Yes, value. No? I love that word value. Yeah. Add more value, make yourself valuable so yeah. that, you know, the world does need you. So when you do get asked that question, you know, make yourself um, indispensable. Ex exactly. Exactly. You know, so that when you do ask yourself, you know, and you've got that sort of tormented artist sort of thing going on in your mind and you say, you know, does the world need another song? Does the world really need my work? Does the world? Yeah, it does make yourself so incredible. And I think that mm. probably, mm. uh, leads maybe to like reinventing so I know yeah exactly on that, like exactly another time, but so yeah. so you know in, in my stupid story at the beginning really what i was saying is that each time that i came up against a point where i felt that i needed to do something else 
I had to find a way to afford to do that next thing, to take that next step, to find that next step. And you can't really do that by yourself. You need that with people around you, your loved ones, your friends, your, your clients, et cetera, et cetera. And then you make the next leap, I think. Maybe, maybe not. It's, it's, a, it's a desire to make change. Is that, is that too big of a sweeping statement? Yes. Okay. No. Do, do you guys want to change? Room. Yeah. Do you guys want to change things? Or do you want to just go home and play with your Xbox? I don't know. That's fun too, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love your point about the kids thing. The kids, the kids they, they, have, they don't look for, prom, for permission to change things. They, they assume that I'm, if I'm going to have fun and keep having fun, Aren't you going to do this with me? Aren't you going to pull things apart with me? And you're going, well, Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin, you guys know who Aaron Sorkin is, um, wrote uh, West Wing and he wrote Moneyball and he wrote Social Network and he, uh, you know, won an award last won a bunch of awards. Yeah. The Globes. Oh, did he? Did anyone he went, watch yeah. the Globes? No one watches those things anymore. Crazy. I do. I do too. Uh, but Aaron Sorkin <laughs> makes this point that, you know, if you ever meet a mechanic, and you, you know, and they're really good at their job, and uh, you quiz them. They've always been pulling cars apart. They've always been stripping engines and then putting them back together since they were young. Mm. You meet a computer technician who's really good at their job. They know how to pull apart a computer and put it back together perfectly. Why on earth is it not the same with the arts? So my challenge to every songwriting student I have is why can't you pull apart a song into its components and put it back together? The amount that you learn mm. from doing that Mm. is phenomenal and we need to be able to do that mm. as creatives this idea of it being whimsical and sort of somehow coming down from the clouds into our brains is kind of crap you have to pull it apart learn how to pull it back together so that you know what space you're playing in and that's what a four-year-old does they yeah. just don't put it back together i i <laughs> you just made me think a, a, a really long time colleague of mine had two kids and they were twins so it came to the age where she's saying, well, I'm going to have to buy two computers for these kids. Do you know what the kids told their mum? You don't have to worry, mum. We've sent away mail order for kits to make our own computers. So it's that kind of thing. It's like, do you have to buy something out of a box or do you actually just make it yourself? If I, if I want to play the banjo, do I make it out of a, piece, a box and put some wires on it before I actually have the deluxe version? So I don't know. I th I think we're at we're at a time, and we we kick this around a lot. How how do we break the eggs at a time where things are quite not about breaking eggs? Or am I wrong? Is there is there room to break a lot of eggs, or do we have to give make stuff for what the audience likes? Ooh, st stumped, stumped the... Read Austin Cleon. Has, has everyone read Austin Cleon's book, Show Your Work? Oh, yes. yes the yes. process, he makes the point that the process is the product. That we've been, we've been wrong this whole time thinking that the, the product is, you know, the final thing is the product. The process is the product. There are so many people, yeah. there are millionaires on YouTube who make YouTube channels showing the process of how they make the thing. They never finish making the thing. Yeah. They just show you how to make the thing. They, they actually don't have any craft skills at all. Well, they have no finished product. But no. they make millions of dollars a year showing you how to make the thing. And I think there is an appetite for, for people wanting to know how the thing gets made more yeah. than ever before. And I think there's the medium, the internet has allowed people to basically show you how to make anything. And there's a fascination with it. So Does I- Everybody know about the hero um, painter who shows you how to paint? Who, 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 am I, who am I talking about, everybody? Thank you. He, he's like the, isn't he like the Dalai Lama of, of make art by yourself? <laughs> so who is that way in music? Who's the person that you guys follow who seems to be able to invent new music, beautiful music, incredible music, but he doesn't follow any formula, any theory. He's like a little bit removed from what you would say the treadmill. Is there such a person? There's so many. I mean, you think of like Beck and people like that or, yeah. or Radiohead who, who do not have a genre. 
you, know, <laughs> you can't put a genre on Beck or Radiohead. There is they, no pigeonhole. They just say, I, we're just going to do it however we feel like this album and the next album will be something different. That's, yeah, yeah. They get to transcend genre. Yeah. And that's kind of the most, I think that's the most beautiful space you can play in if you're an artist to not, to, to buy yourself the luxury of not being pigeonholed. Yeah. Okay, so uh, nice prompt there from Alan Chen. Um, to talking about uh, walking the line, this thing between science and art. If we think about, if we think about the making of, you know, all the stuff that we make via digital programs, the things that we draw, the things we paint, the things that we construct, is there not a science to actually, when, when you're saying unscramble the song and put it into its parts, and you got to fit it back together again, isn't that a science? Is that a science? I think it's half. So what you're saying is art and science, you know. Yeah. Is it both? Look, I, I would have to say it is definitely a science. It's a hundred, well, okay, it's 50% a science um, and 50% uh, luck. Whimsical, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Inspiration. So this, is, this is sort of the way I see it. And um, I did write myself a couple of notes, but like, that's more so for your sake rather than my sake because, you know, I don't want to keep you here any longer than you need to be. But um, so the science of it is knowing, like what Ben was saying, knowing exactly the formula you're using. So pulling it apart mm. or studying other people, studying other uh, composers or musicians, you know, in, in our industries, obviously, but then, um, you know, design students, you, you know, the, the people, the people that you idolize, looking at their work and pulling it apart and saying, how did they achieve this? Right. Mm, mm. How can I maybe not reinvent what they did completely? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. The wheel has been made. But how can I do something similar or a little different or enhance that? Or mm. let's, let's sort of take this to the next level. So education and knowledge is power. And I think that's the science behind it. That's why you're here at J JMC. Are you all JMC students or are there a few people from, you know, outside? No? Okay, so you're all, so that's why you come to universities. That's why you come, is to learn the science of it. Um, and then I sort of feel that you can, you can study that stuff and you can, I've known people who, who seem to, they theoretically know everything, you know, by textbook. Oh, and they right. go, yep, I've studied that. I've got all these degrees. Um, I, I know everything there is to, mm -hmm. to know about this software and this thing and this thing and this thing. But then, then there's that magical ele element that you need. Mm. And not everyone, I believe, has that. But I, I sort of believe that if you're here in this room or if you've actually taken that initiative to study, then mm. you probably do have that element in you. And, and I almost feel like that's the, the sorry to get a bit woo-woo here, but like, <laughs> it's like the divine Okay. Well, it's like well, inspiration. It's, it's, it's you, yeah. You feel that that you're that you're brave enough to step into that kind of unknown space, right. that kind of mystical, magical space, right. because you're saying nobody else is going to do it, so it's better be me. Yeah, and I think if you're like in a way, again, as I said, like it's going a bit woo woo, you know. But just bear with me for just a second. Like you, if you know, if you've got the tools to use, you know, you've got mm. you've got the knowledge. Well, if you've got everything, but then you kind of you have divine. Uh, actually, comes from uh, uh, it's a Latin word. Mm. Um, I can't remember what the Latin word is, but but it means to breathe life. Yeah, and if you go biblical, like if you go to you know Adam, he you know God breathed life into him. You know, and so that's what you're sort of doing is is you're you're getting inspired. Mm. You're putting life into this project. So that's why I say like there's you need to know the science of your craft and what you're doing. You know, you yeah. can't just, you can't just go like, Oh, I'm just going to hope for the best, you know, and just rely simply on divine. I mean, that does happen too, you know, in certain areas it's, it's, you know, there's an innate, mm -hmm. I think there's an innate um, yeah. creativity in all of us, you know, in our soul. But then once you combine that with the science, I think you've got this incredible power. So that's, that's so, my take on yeah, it anyway. Uh, I totally agree. It's this thing about you, you learn the rules of the game. And if you if you have all those skills and you can make all those things, give give me a project that I can throw at that. But I think what you're saying is that there's there's that extra bit. It's the X factor. It's that extra 
distance. I, how do I describe this, Ben? I don't know what I'm talking about suddenly. So <laughs> I don't care about theory unless I get to make stuff with it. So I, I, I look back at some of the ideas I used to jot down in my notebooks when I was 12, and I look back and go, damn, that's some okay ideas. You know, as a 12-year-old, I was pretty Who happy with this them. guy? <laughs> And that's really disappointing in another level too, because you go, I have not really developed that much. Mm. But what, what it reminds me of is that as a 12 year old, I had no ability to execute on those ideas. So for me, the science of what we do in whatever field you're in is to get as many tools as I can and get really comfortable with those tools so that when an idea comes along, I get to execute it really well. Mm. And that's, that's all I care about with theory. It allows me to basically, because ideas are coming all the time. Mm. And the frustration of having ideas coming at you all the time, but not having the tools to execute on them, is a, it's really frustrating. So this is why we call it a discipline or a practice. And so you, Because it's yeah. actually, yeah. you are continually practicing mm. these skills, mm. these tools in different scenarios, different contexts, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And you're, you know, we, we teach students, craft and science are very close. And we mm. can talk about, we can talk about technique and we talk about what makes good process. And to me, that's really important to empower students to then be able to execute on their ideas because mm. their ideas will be personal. The art of what they do is personal. I don't have an opinion on what you want to talk about. I do have an, an opinion on how you best execute that idea. Okay. And, and so the science for me, instead of it being art versus science, it, it's science and then art and then science and art. You're toggling back and forth as yeah. you upskill and then, and, and then execute on an idea and upskill and execute on an idea. So Amara, are you, are you thinking that if we have science and art, are you then going, well, I'm inspired by this project, not so much by this and not at all by this? No, no, but I'm just, I'm saying, do you, are you, are you looking for that quality? Are you looking to be inspired by that quality? I think they're definitely, ha I think once you have the, that sort of that theory, theory um, mm. or theoretical understanding and the tools like Ben was talking mm. about, um, it becomes, even if you, you don't have that divine moment, mm. you're still able to go into that toolbox and there still is going to always be, like in, I think that's in anything that we do. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. Mm ideas and, and thoughts that that's they come from somewhere somewhere that we can't explain but having that toolbox mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know definitely helps you with that so i mm -hmm. think when it, when it comes to a brief say and it's not necessarily something super exciting mm -hmm. uh and you're not necessarily thrilled about it uh you can still try and find because of the toolbox that you have right. and the way maybe you've disciplined your mind. I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, th th there's a certain sort of, I mean, I could go into like a whole, I will not well, promise you, but I think if you discipline your mind, you know, you can definitely uh, find inspiration, even in the projects that you don't necessarily, you know, um, like. So uh, it looks like we're begin being given the wind up here, gang. Like our day, our, our time has been zooming along. Uh, are we actually thinking that it's time for a Q and A, or you Diana? Want to last question. Or last question. No, we well, I, I think to I think to put a, a cap on everything we've been talking about. I think I think we're talking about when we think talk about science. It's very it's actually quite logical. Science is the logic. It's the it's the the cultural thing that's been put in train for a number of years, and it's been and it's a well trodden path. But the art is something that's more intangible and something more lightning rod like that that comes, you know, like uh, it's it's we're there in the room at that particular time and we all know how to do this thing, but there's something that happens that we are able to put in the bottle. Yeah. So is that what we're kind of searching for? That sounds good. Absolutely. The the logic and the inspiration. Time for the Q and A. Is that kind of what you're saying so does anybody here is anybody brave enough to ask the most um uh earth shattering question out of all that we've been talking about for the last 25 minutes does anybody have a question or a thought even or or how do i or does somebody have some sort of question or thought that you would like to throw to all of us yes sir How, how do you start breaking eggs with other people? Uh, 
with are these people that you don't know or do know? You want to be breaking eggs with them. Is that's the first thing? Do you 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 want to? Oh, so they're people that you already know, and you just sort of want to collaborate with them. Is it? Uh, can, yeah, can I just quickly answer the question about like maybe the people that you don't know because you can get really, um, there's a safety net in the people that you see every day, you know, in your in your classes and breaking eggs with them kind of becomes the, you, you know, you, you get to know their nuances, yeah, yeah. you know, and and it's that's kind of easy. It's easy to stay in the safe zone with those people, but I'm just going to touch really quickly on breaking eggs. I love this breaking eggs thing we got going here, but um, breaking eggs with people who you don't know, and that comes into, uh, and I love talking about this networking or connecting connections, meeting new people. Like how many people out there uh, feel comfortable sort of just working a room and chatting with people and say like, yeah, hi, I'm Bob. Do you want to break eggs together? Anyone? Does anyone sort of feel like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm all good for that? No, it's always a bit daunting, right? So um, I'd say that get outside your comfort zone and start doing that more because that's where you talk about lightning. That's where those sort of collaborations yeah. uh, come into being a little more because when you step outside the safety zones, I think, you know, it's easy when you're here to kind of, it, it doesn't mean that you can't make magic and, and lightning in a bottle here, but extend yourself even more, you know, and go outside, you know, use anyone got LinkedIn, use LinkedIn, the power of LinkedIn. It's great. Like get on there. It's, it's, I think it's better than Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and, and whatever is out there, but just, you know, get out there and start conversations, you know, start commenting uh, on people's posts and, you know, getting involved and, and finding what's outside this world, because guess what, when you leave here, that's when, you know, the, the real work starts. So, um, that's my recommendation, breaking eggs with other people outside of here. Can I just ask, what's the, what's the impedance? Like, what's the problem with breaking eggs with other people? Um, like, why do you ask the question? Um, I think it's intimidating to break eggs with other people. Yeah. So yeah. There, sh there needs to be like, uh, yeah, you, want, you need to be daring enough to do it, but sometimes you don't know where to start. Yeah, I think, and I think that's at the heart of what you're asking is how do you trust other people with, with your own creative process, which, which makes a lot of us feel very naked. You know, to show your creative process is a very vulnerable thing because if you're, you know, if I'm asking my songwriting students to, to do their job, I'm asking them to, to get raw and to talk about things that are sometimes upsetting and sometimes very personal. And generally they want to speak about mental health and they want to speak about relationships and they want to speak about stuff that's, that's really quite hard to talk about openly. And so there has to be this great sensitivity. If I'm going to collaborate or break eggs with anyone else, I have to show great empathy and great sensitivity as a first step and show that I care deeply about creating a safe space for you to step into. Because if I don't do that, I, I can't really expect anyone to want to share these, these, you know, personal moments with me. Um, so that, that for me is everything, creating that trust, creating that safe space. Awesome, thanks. Yes, shout it. I forget who said it, but there's this idea that if you have an idea, and um, if you think of an idea, but you don't do anything about it within the first five seconds of it coming up, you're never going to act on it. I love that. Who yeah, said that? I honestly forget. I wish I knew. But yeah, um, there's an idea. Um, how would you guys, with that in mind, within the first five seconds, be able to act on that idea or throw it away, if that makes any sense? Like, how do you know that uh, this is something worth working on um, within the, or at least I, putting pen to paper? I think, great, yeah, great question. But I think you've also just answered it there, you know, by saying what, what you said. And, and I know there's somebody that also says a similar thing. Uh, she's called Mel Robbins. And... Um, you know, she says five seconds, you know, if you don't do it within like exactly what we said, if you don't do it within five seconds, or if you don't make that decision within five seconds, it's gone. Yeah. So, and I've actually made, that's a, it's a great question because I've made that a habit and a practice in every area of my life. So you don't have to necessarily just apply it to the design thing, but apply it to every aspect of your life. So if you think, and I'm going to come over to um, your question as well and integrate the two, say you're going up and you want to meet somebody and you want to talk and you think, okay, should I, should I go over to that person? Should I introduce myself? Oh, I don't know, five, four, three, two, you know, time's counting down. Five seconds. If you don't do, if you don't go up to that person in five seconds, 
you're not going to do it. So just you kind of you just got to do it within that five seconds. That's my that's my idea. So why I've said you've answered your question there. Just just do it. Nike said it. Yeah. Just do it. I'm going to go the other way, just to be difficult. Um, I take a lot of notes, like copious amounts of notes, and. I generally think, you know, that song ideas, like all ideas are, are often time sensitive. So you'll, you'll come up with an idea that is really relevant to the time, something that's happening in the media, something that's happening socially. And then you go, this is, this is so relevant. And you leave it for a few months and then you come back to trying to write it and you go, okay, now it's not so relevant. It why, doesn't feel why fresh. Why are you leaving it for a few months? Yeah, because I've got two kids and it's a problem. <laughs> um, the four-year-old is just pulling crap apart. Um, but there are ideas i there i also use this sort of filter where there are ideas that i just test by leaving them alone and when they keep coming back to annoy me like week after week there is a timelessness to some ideas that don't rely on time as they don't have a time stamp and those are the ones i love playing with as well because you, you, at some point when they've tapped you on the shoulder for the fifth time you, you get the idea that they're not leaving you alone and that's when you get to go okay cool let's let's talk um, but I think saying that all ideas behave the same way and all ideas hit us with the same gravitas and all ideas occupy the same sort of mental space, that's, that's also not true in my opinion. They, they have all these different ways of talking to us and they have all these different time frames. And so to be as flexible as you can, to write down as much as you can, to act on as much as you can, that's great. And then see what happens. You'll find your own process. That, that's um, the, the whole oh, thing. So, so uh, what Ben said before, what you're doing with your everyday, you are actually making finished products. You are, you are, you know, they're all in different time frames. You know, you've got assessments that are due next Tuesday. You've got this meeting in a few weeks and you're working on this thing. You've got a potential opportunity to hear. Like, you just have to keep it in motion. This combination of the science and the art and the experience and the opportunity, you just keep doing. You do and do and do and do. And you gain confidence from this. You get this, you know, I'm looking at all of you and you're like, I don't have any confidence. How am I going to get some confidence? You get it by taking the risk and taking the chance and actually making the noise in the class at the time. You actually say, why are we doing this stuff? Like, I, I always say this to students. I'm always saying, why do you want to just get it right? Why, why are you looking at the assessment and sort of going, is this what you want? Is this the correct thing? And I'm saying to you, you're going to get more marks if you take a risk here. It's, and people go, oh, I don't want to fail. And I'm going, maybe by failing, you're actually going to do that thing where you're going to break an egg. You're going to fail in maybe it, as, as part of what the assessment is asking for, but at the same time, you're discovering something else. So the whole thing about, about this thing of the creative life, which is very, very complicated, would you agree? It's not, it's not simple because you have to somehow make it work for yourself. But if you are confident, if you believe in what you're doing and you keep at it, you're going to, you're going to, something's going to happen. If you stop and you think, I don't have this, I'm, I'm, um, it just doesn't feel good. You got to bat that away and make it work. There's a, we have an online question. Um, how do you validate your art in the market and what makes a good design or product? Validate. Yeah, validates. That's a tough. How do you validate your art in the market? How do you validate your art? Like, I've, you see, validations for me were usually one of those things that people are looking to other people for. Um, there are there for me is a minimum requirement. You know, where if if I'm working on an idea, it crosses a threshold at some point where I've put enough work into it where it's now in the ballpark. Like it's playing with other people in that space of a level that is, you know good enough um, to then say, okay, we're, we're getting close. That, that is like a form of validation because everything short of that, you're like, no, not quite, not there. Um, that's, that's my take on validation. You got something? I agree. 
What are, and what was the other part? What I, makes I a great product? What's, what makes a great... Well, this is complicated because Picasso only sold that one painting to his brother, right? So no one validated him. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of not a great that's not a great feeling for him. But we, since he died, we we validate him. And so there is this messed up thing that happens in the art world where you go, "Geez, I don't even know how to unpack that." And that's why I think you've you 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 you're you're really on a journey of discovery and process and growth and investigation and validation really is one of those things that I feel other people can talk about. It's, it's kind of like if you're in the thick of making things and you love doing what you do, other people can validate it. Mm, thoughts? Anybody have a thought on that? Mm, very, very dry question. So, so th this idea of validation means that what you're doing is worthy. How do you get validated? If you're a, if you're a singer or a songwriter or a musician, do you, do you get validated because your song was published and it went out into the world? Nope. Is, is that enough? So your validation is I finished it and that's all. It as far as I'm concerned, I validated this myself. I had an intent and I, I satisfied that intent. Mm. That's for a song, though. Well, that's, I, that's not. That's a song where you you're, haven't been. You're set starting. A brief. It's starting to sound like um, if a tree falls in the forest, yeah. does anybody know that it fell? See, Amara might say that you know if you've got Look, a brief, I, you know yeah, it's a different I thing. I love. I love challenging sort of ideas that we've sort of been, but you know that we've been led to believe or that we've been told our whole lives. Like for example, people will say, um, "You don't need the validation from anyone else." You know, you don't need anyone else's validation. You should only just rely on, you know, as long as you feel okay with it. And, and you know, I, I think I, I agree mostly with what, you know, Ben's saying. And then I just love there's that other sort of part of my, my brain that goes, or maybe um, you, it's not about you, you know. Um, maybe it's not all about your art and what you know and and i've i've really sort of looked into the whole sort of ego and and then the narcissist artist and i don't mean the word narcissist in a in a bad way you know you are all narcissists you know and, and i'm not insulting you you know we are all narcissists yeah, it's yeah, just human that's it there's a, <laughs> you're all gonna go she's insulting me now but you know when we get past that and go like we all have narcissistic tendencies and then go it's actually not um about me this piece of art this is about you and you and you it's about all of you i want to write a piece of music or i want to design something or i want to um you know i want to create a story a film for the people not for me but for mm. people so that people can consume this and enjoy it and it can affect someone else's life and i think there's sort of that other side but you know like what ben was saying and, and i think you know I think we can kind of agree maybe with both sides of it, you know, as long as we're sort of aware of both sides. So that's why I say I like to challenge those yeah. sort of... There's the spirit. Yeah. There's the, 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 the whimsical spirit of it. And then there's the real world. And the real world requires, you know, that there is going to be some feedback. There's going to be some, some, yeah. some validation. Well, yeah. there's going to be lots of validation, but uh, I don't want to start from that place. I want to start from a place of intrinsic value and joy in the process and, process, then, exactly. and then move yeah. to the yeah. second phase. Yeah. Mm. Then you won't please anyone as well if you're not yeah. actually enjoying the process yeah. and, and pleasing yourself. And that kind of ties back to yeah. what you were talking about before about yeah. the process. Yeah. These musicians, you know, hey, like what, what, do you say, what do you say to the client who you're very friendly with and very social with when they say, I really don't like the logo? I really don't like it. I, what, do you, what don't you like about it? <laughs> you got, I'm serious. I mean, I mean it's, it's, we, we were talking about this before. Amara and I were talking about this. The, the biggest mistake you make is not asking the clarifying question because it, it's, it's always assumed when someone says, I don't like it, that they don't like all of it. And the reality, in my experience, 99% of the time is that they don't like just a, a, one element of it's really bugging them, Yeah, which yeah. is great because you can change one element. Yeah. And it's amazing how, I mean, I did a job for Citibank where they asked for Ocean's Eleven kind of music. And I said, that's not a thing. 
you know, that's that's a film. They said, yeah, but we really like it. I said, great. So then I watched Ocean's Eleven, analyzed it, and went, great. So it's all this kind of heisty, funky, upbeat music, heaps of organ. I made this track. It was funky. It was upbeat. It was like someone was going to rob a bank. And there was an like organ it. in it. They said, we love it. We love it, but, and you, you love the we love it, but moment. We love it, but that organ, mm. don't like that. I was like, mm. that's the whole sound of Ocean's Eleven. And you're trying not to say you, anyway, <laughs> you know, uh, but the great thing is when they say, yeah, no, uh, it's just not working. The clarifying question of why is it not working is really important because there's usually one thing you get to pull out of the mix and, and then, they love and it. And then it's done. It's amazing. The, the gap between them not liking it and loving it is actually very small, mm. but it requires that you ask the follow-up question because the, the younger version of me would have said, well, screw you. You know, we don't like it. Screw you. It's, it's amazing. You know, like yeah, the, yeah. you get all I'm you get walking all out of the room right now. I'm leaving. It's just one clarifying question that I think yeah, okay. is so important. Mm. And, and I think also as well, like you said, the younger you, you know, and that's, that's the thing, you know, when we all start to get a bit of age on our side, we go, ah, oh, okay, right. And I know you're all, you know, young, young in the room and, and um, you, you know, like it, it, it is personal. You can't help sometimes, you know, to, to not take it personally. But then when you get past that again, you know, getting away from getting out of yourself and just kind of like, you know, hardening up a little bit and going, it's not about me, it's about them. And I heard something really timely today um, that, uh, somebody said, replace uh, frustration. So, you know, you might be frustrated when a client doesn't like something. And as you said, you might be like, you know, F you, uh, yeah, you yeah. don't know what you're talking about. You know, I'm the creative here. What are you, you're just the whatever. Um, and replace frustration with fascination. So in other words, when you're really frustrated at something, then replace that and go, that's really interesting that they're coming at it from that angle and that they, they don't like these particular elements and da 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 And, you know, you, you start to sort of like really change the So you're, the you're like, the, and you're also mm. taking back control of the room. Exactly. You're, you're, you're back basically saying you're taking upon that opinion. Where, so I think you're, you're talking about an interesting thing here. You're talking about the co-design process and the art process, which the art process, you're, the val you don't need the validation. What you're making is what you're making. And this is what I'm done. done. Whereas the, yeah. the client is sort of saying, well, wait a second, this is for me and us and my audience. So there's more to it than just you. And, and as soon as you, to do. yeah. And as soon as you seek to understand, especially working with other people, I think this is the thing is as soon as you seek to understand what, what, where they're coming from, yeah. instead of seeking to be understood, you become way less desperate to push your agenda and you really do become empathetic to, to theirs. You know, you really want to understand what they need from this process. It's a whole different, it is a total different switch in mindset and it, and it helps. Oh, I, that's that's what I'm feeling. Yeah. Because I, I'm sitting here trying to um, straddle both sides of this thing because I don't know your world where your potential client is saying, we need a piece of music for this, you know, you see, from a designer perspective, it's it, you've broken down the problem. So you're this is why you're doing this project. So we, we have a reason for doing this. There's an intention to do this. So we're going to tick all those boxes and we're going to get through. And here's the product. But Amara said it, and I think this you summed it up perfectly. It's not personal. The hardest thing is to hold both truths that in order to do your best work, it has to be deeply personal. And in order to engage with clients, it is a, it, it's not at all personal. Mm. They're just looking at it and going, I just need the, the logo or the design or the piece of music to do what I need it to do. That's right. I just need it to do what I need to do. Can you please help me do that? You yeah, know, that's right. You know, It's a transaction. It's a well, job. Well, see, that, that's, to me, isn't that more what design is kind of about? It's about I, I need something that's going to help me do what I need to do you know, grow my brand, have more products, do whatever it might be. But I think what we're saying now is you want to, we want to say to the client, maybe we just want to think about this a little more before we leap to, I don't like green, you know, which is uh, my longtime colleague, uh, Ross Renwick from Billy Blue. He, I remember he turned to me one day, he said, so what are you doing these days? Oh, I'm still doing design for people. He said, aren't you sick of people saying, I don't like your green logo? Like, like, can, can we move on from this? He says, you're still doing that. And I say, somebody's got to do it. You know, you, you can get clients. I, I had a client who rejected a score 
and it took me a long time to work out why they hated the acoustic guitar in it, but they hated the acoustic guitar in it because they, they had tried to learn as a kid and never could. And so that was really personal. Like they were in their fifties and there was like this 40 year scar, guitar shaped scar. right? <laughs> and so I kept trying to make different guitar finger picking patterns oblivious to the fact that he just didn't want to hear any if guitar i hear it. any more finger picking, yeah, yeah, i'm gonna yeah. kill somebody yeah if you keep reminding me of the fact that you can play guitar and i can't we're we're gonna have a problem and it took me a long time to you know so so you pulled it all away and all of a sudden he liked the music well, just, a lot more i didn't ask enough questions well guys i i think you're starting to understand that that the client the artist the designer all these people that are in this process we're all people and it's messy and it's social and it's awkward but we've got to get to the end somehow. We have to get to the intention is what you're saying. Yeah. It's a, well, otherwise, why did we even begin this? Yeah. I've got better things to do. <laughs> I'm handing that over while, while the going's good. I was going to ask if there's any more questions because we're <laughs> a bit out of time, but uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the speakers. That was really amazing. Very insightful for me. Thank you. And thank you, Alan, for the um, beautiful visualization of the conversation that you did. Did you want to have, have, did you want to say anything? Sure, why not? Uh, <clears throat> it's pretty interesting to hear you guys kind of tie everything together that, um, you know, it's a blend of science and art, uh, that it never stands still. I mean, I'm, I'm doing here, I'm doing this sort of stuff alongside you guys speaking. And, you know, hopefully you guys are seeing that, you know, uh, what I'm doing has some kind of rhyme and reason. Um, it's, it, again, it's very interesting to, to hear it coming from somebody else's perspective. I talk about this sort of stuff a lot with, um, you know, with the, my students and my clients. Um, so, yeah, the, the summary of this hopefully is clear. Um, I was just getting into the process of writing that we need to make the actual like, omelette because why do you break eggs in the first place? Um, and I, there, there was one thing that I didn't kind of put in here, which I thought was very vital, uh, which is the trust element. Um, you, Woody, you asked a question before about, you know, how do you get people to break eggs? And the, a lot of what we've been talking about has been, you know, going through this process back and forth, uh, working, learning to work with people. But a big element of this is trust. You kind of have to earn the trust of your, your client. You've got to earn the trust even of yourself to be able to comfortably walk the line, to be able to be comfortable with not standing still. So that's kind of what I got out of the talk. So I don't know if you guys got that, but yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. There's um, drinks and food outside if you want to stick around and talk to the speakers as well. <laughs>